Welcome to Frontline Nursing, a NurseMinder production that gives you an insider's look into the daily life of nursing from those who are currently working on the front lines. Whether you're considering nursing as a profession, you're currently a student, or you're a nurse in transition, this show will give you some behind the scenes information to help you guide your career. Today on Frontline Nursing, we are joined by Sandy Zenyak, an LPN who is working in occupational health for a company called Driver Check. Welcome to the show, Sandy. Hi, thanks for having me. I'm so excited to have you here. <laughs> so first of all, before we get into like your daily job and kind of what it looks like for an occupational health nurse, just give us a little backstory as to how nursing became the profession for you. How did you find it? Um, I think it was like a few different things for me. Um, I have quite a few nurses in my family. So that was kind of always around, always kind of back in the back of my head. Mm -hmm. um, and just having a career that would be fulfilling. I think that was something I always knew I wanted. And then I think my biggest motivator was um, losing someone really close to me to use and addiction. And that was kind of where I wanted to go or where I thought I wanted to go with my nursing originally. Yeah. That makes sense. That's a pretty common um, reason for people to find nursing is they've had an experience. Yeah. Did you then start out in addictions after school or did you do clinicals in addictions? I didn't, no. No. So did you find that that was missing in your experience? Or so I guess maybe let me start with a different question. Is this occupational health your first job after graduating? It, it, it is, yeah. Okay, and so just as a side question, and do you find that that piece is missing? Do you feel like you're still drawn and wanting to explore the mental health part, or does this job fulfill you and make you excited? Um, it's not quite as, I still do, um, like, we do lots of drug and alcohol testing, and, okay. and we have, like, there's substance abuse programs, but for just where I am, I'm, I don't see, like, the really the nitty-gritty of it. I just kind of do the testing and, and send them along. Yeah, so these are job sites that you would um, go to or do the people come and see you? So right now I work in a clinic, um, so people would come to me or to us, but if for whatever reason there's an incident or something like that, uh, we can definitely go to them or like to more remote areas where they might not have an occupational clinic we can travel travel to them okay for this job did you uh, were you required to do any additional courses or training for this position yes so i did a pft pulmonary function test mm -hmm. and audiometric uh, course through McEwen. nice those are both online oh are they really that's awesome. I used to do that um, testing in the military, learned it on the job by the people who were doing it. Yeah. Um, but what a fun thing to do. Yeah. Okay. And were those the only two additional skill sets you needed for this job or was there anything else? Um, no, everything was pretty much um, trained on the job. Yeah. Okay. So what's, what are some of the skills that were specific then for occupational health? that you learned on the job that maybe you wouldn't need in a med surge floor like a lot of our nurses are working? Um, so yeah, like the uh, drug and alcohol testing, like I said, so we do breath alcohol testing, um, urine drug screening, or we can send the, the urine samples to the lab. We also do saliva testing, um, also DNA, so like it could be court ordered, somebody comes in, um, gets a swab done with the parent and child. Um, we also do hair samples. So like for lead poisoning? Um, typically or, you do with drugs, drugs or alcohol. Really? Okay, this is fascinating. Yeah. So maybe you can break down a little bit as to what you're looking for with these different um, samples, if, if that's okay. Yeah. Then we've got hair samples for drugs. So, and I'm not even sure if there's a connection to lead, but that's just what I was thinking was lead yeah. poisoning in hair. I'm gonna have to Google that after. <laughs> Okay, so you do breath, urine, saliva, DNA. DNA is not connected to the drugs though. No. And hair. So let's just talk about maybe the drug and alcohol testing and what those tests kind of give you for information and how intensive they are. Um, so for, for the population that I see, it's a lot of people that 
work in like the trades or the oil field. So before they go to work or before they go to a certain site, they have to get this testing done and they have to be cleared for work. Mm -hmm. so it's very, every company is a little bit different of what they request or depending what the site they're going to request. Um, so there may be certain cutoff for alcohol levels. Um, some companies or places might just be zero tolerance. And then there's all kinds of drug testing as well. So we, what we call panels. So you have a, for example, an eight panel. So that will test for eight different kinds of drugs. Mm -hmm. There's like seven, 12, all kinds of different panels. So again, it's, it's what the company's ordered for us to test for. Yeah. How fast do you get those results back? Is it on a machine that you have right there or do you have to send these samples away? These samples we do it, we can do an instant test mm -hmm. or we can send it away as well. I imagine with an instant test that there's potential for some maybe heightened conversations if they come back positive and are not allowed to go to work. You have the authority to tell them you're not going to the job site then? Um, no, typically we will let um, their company know the results and they'll kind of handle it that way. Although, yeah, it, it does. That's probably not my favorite part. Mm -hmm. I can imagine. I'm only just I'm picturing this guy, this big guy who's like working in the mines or on the oil field and you're telling him, sorry, dude. Yeah. Yeah. Just confronting them is always, cause you never know how they're going to react because this, this has to do like with their job. So yeah, exactly. And um, whether that's a positive result or if they've, what we call tampered with or adulterated their sample mm -hmm. and to confront them about that that's always fun as well yeah why don't you share some of the ways in which they tamper and adulterate what a great word <laughs> so we have a way we call we have something called an adulteration strip so we check the urine sample before we even test it and there's there's like all these criterias that the sample needs to meet before we're even allowed to test it. So mm -hmm. what is the specific gravity, the pH? Um, is it the temperature within a certain range? Um, all those kind of things. What's the craziest thing you've seen? Like, have you actually witnessed them tampering with a sample? So for me, I'm not actually physically watching them pee as well. Oh, you don't have to? Um, no, we stand right outside the door. They have to empty their pockets, take off um, any outerwear, that kind of stuff, but mm -hmm. I'm not, watching them okay um the the craziest thing is you can actually buy synthetic urine online and people try to use that but again we know because the temperature and stuff yeah temperature um yeah yeah i used to work with homeless population i worked mm -hmm. at a clinic that was run by the university of new brunswick and we had to, I'm pretty sure we stayed in the room with them to observe them urinate to make sure it was their urine because crazy things like they will have it up their sleeve, they'll have this little vial of urine or. Yeah. 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 There's, you, you always hear, because you're supposed to listen just directly outside the door and you hear all kinds of things like bags scrunching and stuff like that. In, and with the company I work for, even if you suspect. Um, some kind of tampering, you can confront them about that, ask them for another sample and see if they <laughs> see if they um, actually give their real sample. Wow, okay. So in terms of the drugs, so you're tell me about this hair sample. What is, do you know what the hair sample is looking for? Mm, not really, because we send that one off to the lab. We don't do a, like an instant test with that. Mm -hmm. I find typically it's someone who's been put on um, a program, so what we call a SAP, Substance Abuse Program, within their company. Um, so maybe they'll come and do a drug and alcohol test once a month, but then after a while they'll do um, a hair sample and that just goes back way further than, than your urine sample. So, sure. yeah. yeah, that's really yeah. interesting to me. Really interesting. Yeah. Okay, so let's talk about one of those moments you've had to confront. Let's get into some juicy stuff. <laughs> <laughs> Obviously, we're not going to disclose anything confidential. Yeah, of course. Just, just kind of, uh, 
you know, a synopsis of mm -hmm. what a moment like that might look like and how you dealt with it successfully, unsuccessfully, maybe even both sides of that. Okay. Um, so with the company I work for, again, I can't speak for all yeah. auto health companies, but um, if we, if someone were to give a fake sample or a sample that was cold, um, we ask them for a second sample. So we basically give them another chance to really provide their own sample. Mm -hmm. um, but then we're just going to send it directly to the lab. We're not going to test it there in the clinic. And so then, you don't test the second sample? No. And what's the rationale behind that? I think, actually, I don't really know. I think because if it is positive, we have to send it to the lab anyways. So we just send it directly to the lab. That makes sense. They're anticipating if they're tampering that it's probably they're hiding something. Yeah, exactly. Okay. Fair enough. Um, so we ask them to provide a second sample. Typically they ask, well, why? And they get very defensive. And for us, we don't have to disclose anything really. Um, I typically just say, if your sample doesn't meet certain criteria, we ask that you submit another one. Again, they're always prying, asking why, that kind of stuff. And I said, I'm sorry, that's all I'm obligated to tell you. And they have up to three hours to provide a, another sample. Um, if they leave during that time or before they've provided a second sample, it's considered a refusal to test. Mm -hmm. So either, very rarely, I find they'll stay and actually submit their own urine. Yeah, they'll just leave? Yeah, they just leave. Oh, I have a, another appointment or or something like that. Sure, and then you just report that to the company that they refuse and then that's up to them what they do with it? Yeah, exactly. Mm, interesting, I'd love to know what they do with it. <laughs> like to be a fly on that wall. <laughs> oh my goodness. Okay, so that's actually not too bad then. Um, if they have the right to refuse, then I suppose yeah. the risk of a heated confrontation is probably pretty low. I also have the right to refuse test them if there is, you know, verbal abuse or mm. anything like that, you know, so that's a nice option as well. That's, you know, in today's work, well, in today's life, we have, um, you know, marijuana is legal now. Yeah. Are you seeing that show up higher in, in your drug testing? Like, is, there, is there a higher population now coming back positive? Do you notice if there's been a change or a shift? Do you get the results back? Not really. I find, again, it's really up to the companies what they decide with, because yeah, it's, it's, it's legal, but there wasn't really any guidelines set for the workplace. Okay. So it's, yeah. it's a very gray area and I probably get that question like once a day. Yeah, because I know that, I mean, obviously there's the medical marijuana, people are on it, and as long as they disclose it and the employer is okay with it, I do know somebody who has medical marijuana and has a hard time getting a job because even if they dose once a day, they've been told that they will test positive. I, I don't know how long it stays in the system, maybe yeah. you do and you can share that, but um, because of that need to dose every day and the job, they're also a tradesperson. They cannot get a job because if they were to ever randomly test, they would fail. Yeah, that's what I mean. It's such a gray area, but um, bottom line is you can't be impaired at work. So just like alcohol, we test for that as well. Mm -hmm. It's legal, but you can't be impaired at work. And then I've, I do find a lot of companies are switching to saliva testing. So that can test more like in the, in the 24 hours rather than your urine where it's been metabolized and goes a little bit further back. Mm -hmm. But again, it's really up to the company of what, of what they decide and yeah. Interesting. Have you had extra training now around um, marijuana because it's legal now in terms of how that affects um, patients and sampling or anything like that? Is there anything special that you had to learn for that? Um, not really. We do have, um, like physicians that work not with us, but within the company and they'll send uh, out memos and that kind of stuff when like things get updated in regards to, to marijuana and that kind of stuff, but nothing too in depth, no. Okay, yeah. just, just related as it comes up, that's cool. Good to know, were you nervous when that first became legal? A 
little bit because I definitely thought it was going to be showing up a lot more. I think it shows up just about the same amount. But yeah, just always getting questions about it every day. Uh, I'm sure they're asking, so uh, how long does it stay in my urine? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Do we have an answer for that? What is the answer? Every, everybody is different on how they metabolize and like if you're a chronic smoker or occasional smoker, it really, it all depends. Uh, yeah. Hey, there goes the dog. Woof. Yeah. <laughs> That's awesome. All right, that's really cool. So that's only one aspect of your job, and that's kind of a fascinating one. Mm -hmm. Tell me what else would you do for an occupational health nurse working at your organization? So as I mentioned before, the PFT and audios. Mm -hmm. So um, that um, the nurses, we, you don't have to be a nurse to work in occupational health as well. You can be just a drug and alcohol technician. Um, and you can get your certifications for your PFT and audio, um, but the nurses will do also medical exams. So that basically includes all the stuff I learned in my very first semester of nursing that I thought I would never use again. <laughs> <laughs> kind of a basic head to toe, very, very basic head to toe assessment, like a lot of range of motion, um, that kind of stuff, Snellen, checking their vision and that kind of stuff. Yeah. And then a few other things that I never learned, like checking, assessing reflexes, mm -hmm. um, upper and lower reflexes, um, using, I never used an otoscope before, so using that, um, yeah, blood pressure, auscultating the lungs, that kind of stuff. And then there's different kind of levels of medicals that I would do. So again, depending what the company asks for, some may be more in depth where others would just be a basic kind of head to toe. Okay. Are there, so I, the company you work for obviously contracts out then to these larger organizations in which they need these assessments done. So you're kind of like yeah. a point of care for all of these different organizations. Yeah. Okay. That makes sense. And so then when somebody comes in, are you booking like one organization on one day so you can kind of get set with what their protocols are or could it be anything one patient to the next you could be oil field you could be I don't know what other um, organizations do you work for again um, we do lots of truck drivers yeah. uh, pilots a lot of in-flight crew we do the that's too okay. um, yeah even like if you are receptionist in one of these companies are going to work remotely for them sometimes they'll even do some some kind of testing okay so then uh, now that I kind of have that situated, going back to the question, is there a day where you just work with company X and do all the flight crew? No, it's whenever no. they need to get in, we try to get them in and get whatever they need done. Yeah, so you have to really be familiar um, with how to access the resources for those particular companies quickly, hey? Yeah, after a while you do, you do kind of um, get used to what, what they need. But. Mm -hmm. So are you typically Monday to Friday, then eight to four, or does this job require you to be on call evenings? Typically Monday to Friday, um, yeah, 8.30 to five for me. You can be on call. So if um, say in the middle of the night, there's an incident with somebody at a site working night shift, you can go and do their drug and alcohol testing for them. Mm -hmm. uh, like I said, as well, you can travel. So to those remote areas, like I'll be going to I can't even, I don't even know what it, where it is. Somewhere remote, Alberta, they don't have an, an OC health clinic there. So I'll be going to do some PFTs, pulmonary function tests, and also mask fitting, which is another thing that I do. So respirator fitting. Yep. Yeah. Is your area then just Alberta or would you go outside of Alberta into the territories maybe or BC? Um, yeah, I, we've had some people within our company go to BC. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, I do find a lot of organizations in Alberta when they have kind of like that scope of practice for other organizations where they manage them that they end up having a wider territory. Yeah. That they cover. That would be cool. A little travel maybe in your future. Yeah. Yeah. And also I actually got to, had the opportunity to work at one of the oil fields up north mm -hmm. for the summer. So I was doing seven days on, seven off. Basically doing all the kind of stuff I do now, just up in a in a big oil field camp. So tell me, what was that experience like compared to being in an urban center? It was interesting because I had never been 
anywhere like that before. And I was doing a little bit more um, because there I was working alongside a nurse practitioner, um, another nurse, all the firefighters were there as well. So I would also assist with them if they needed anything. But for the most part, I was still doing um, drug and alcohol testing and the employees wow. there needed annual health assessments. So they'll come in and get their masks refitted, um, check their hearing and doing the lung tests and that kind of stuff as well. Did you enjoy the seven on, seven off, working kind of remotely in those environments? What were I some did. of the pros? I did. The seven days off was... <laughs> <laughs> but at that time, I was also on call. So I was working 12 hours, seven days a week, also on call, but still expected to go um, work my 12 hour shift. Sometimes I had to drive into town, so into Fort Mac to drop off samples if they had to go to the lab. So yeah, sometimes it was a lot. Mm -hmm. Tell, talk to us, maybe give us an example of one of the craziest days that you had to manage and what, what that kind of could look like. So if someone's considering occupational health, particularly mm -hmm. working for these industries, what would be like a crazy day? In the clinic or up in a... Um, let's start with the clinic and then we'll go up into the remote area. <laughs> so typically we kind of know the day before what our schedule will look like. So you, craziest thing would be um, jam-packed day, back-to-back -back appointments, and then maybe something happens, someone has to come in for a post-incident or a post-accident test, so then that kind of throws off all your other appointments and they have priority. And then maybe someone can't pee, someone can't pee enough, someone cheated. So, then somebody else had an accident and had to come in. So it just kind of um, throws your whole day off of, of how you wanted it to go. Yeah, a lot of adjusting on the fly. It sounds like you need to be able to react to the, the changing environment. Yeah, and just kind of prioritize and, you know, work with um, your well, coworkers. Those skills, those skills never leave. Doesn't matter what kind of nursing you're doing, right? We're always having to prioritize, reassess, readjust. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. Okay, so that sounds pretty typical for a clinic. I mean, obviously we have our schedule and we think things are gonna go great, but yeah. there's always those boomerangs that come in and throw us off kilter. What about up north? I'm not sure, how long did you get to spend up on, at the oil field? I was there for three, three and a half months. Wow, you were there for a good chunk of time, so you've got yeah. a really good picture of what it looks like. Okay, yeah. talk to us about a crazy day there then. What would that be like? Um, honestly, when I was there, it wasn't too bad, but it would probably be about the same, plus some um, assisting the nurses if they needed anything. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, typically there wasn't a whole lot going on there when I was there. Okay, so it's kind of, it's kind of quiet. You know, the key word, nobody likes to say that. I like yeah. to say that word. <laughs> I will stand in the middle of the hallway at the, at the workplace and say the, the quiet word <laughs> just to watch everybody scatter and, and panic. No, you said the keyword. Yeah, don't say that. It's my favorite word. <laughs> <laughs> Did you ever have to, so when I think of nursing up in the oil fields, I think of accidents that happen and then how the nursing and the healthcare team has to respond on site and manage those scenes. So maybe this is doing CPR, maybe this is someone who's just had a significant cut and is losing blood. Did you get to participate in any of those? A little bit. Um, I would just assist the NP or the RN alongside me, like if they needed some kind of dressing, like they had, it was a little mini hospital there. Wow. Um, but they had lots of paramedics and firefighters. So I know there was one day, I think there was someone rolled a truck or something. So they went out and looked after that. I just kind of stayed. Yeah. Uh -huh. mm -hmm. And so you didn't really witness too much then? individuals no, no okay that's okay and that's actually probably a good thing but in three and a half months that's I think that's actually really good that you didn't have to attend to much of yeah that. exactly yeah that talks about their safety record for sure yeah all right so I'm going to just ask some questions here <clears throat> let's see what is the biggest problem that you see in terms of 
bridging from a nursing student graduating and taking on this role of occupational health? And what do you think would, would fix it? So I just want to kind of get a sense as to where you think the gaps are in the system. It's a big question. Yeah, it is. Uh -huh. um, Did you feel prepared? No. Okay. And that's <laughs> pretty common. That's absolutely common. Nobody feels prepared on their <laughs> job. So mm -hmm. what was it that you think could have helped you be better prepared to assume an occupational health role? Aside from the training, like we already talked about, you know, mm -hmm. you need to go to PFTs and the audiometric and some of the drug testing, but was there anything in particular that you thought, gosh, this should be part of the program? Like we should learn this stuff. Um, I don't know. I think for me, I always had a lot of questions when I was doing the medical portion. So because it was my first job right out of school, I didn't have any previous experience. So maybe when someone was talking about their health history, I wasn't always confident or sure about, you know, what they were talking about because I didn't have much of a background in anything uh -huh. else. Uh -huh. yeah. I can see that. I mean, it's hard to have a framework when you haven't had to care for somebody with AFib or you know, Crohn's disease and how does that, how do you navigate that then in the workplace and yeah. manage those clinical symptoms and the treatment and still be productive? Yeah, exactly. Mm -hmm. What about post? So I'm thinking back now when I worked at Cadet Camp, one of the staff members that I had to care for was post cardiac arrest and I think within six weeks released from the hospital. So really early in her recovery and here she is at work and now she's part of my responsibility. Yeah. I remember thinking, what are you doing here? Like, I don't want this responsibility because I was alone. I didn't have any other healthcare providers. Um, have you had anything like that come through? Somebody who's post-op or post-procedure and is coming back to work and you have to navigate that? Um, maybe not to that extent, but yes, um, with the company I work for too, we, they're originally based out of Ontario. So we have like a whole other, um, our head office is out there and we have lots of support there. So anytime I have a question, we have a whole Oc Health nurse team, physicians, like anything. So I always have that support if I ever have any questions. Typically, I just get all the information I can, do my charting. Um, I'm not the end-all, say-all, like, yes, you're going to go to work. No, you're not going to go to work. Or maybe, mm -hmm. maybe there's something in the middle. Like, you can go to work, but you're going to have these restrictions till this and this is done or, or what have you. Yeah. So you, you are a part of that process, that conversation? I mean, obviously, you're collecting the data, so... Yeah, a little bit. Like, like they're going to... Um, take the look, take a look at all the notes and assessments that I've done. And yeah, I am, I'm like, yeah, the main person who said, sees them. So yeah, but then, then the, um, the other team member would assign the restrictions and the return to work plan. Yeah. They have kind of more knowledge of, of that area of like what, maybe what exactly their job title sure. is, what their, what, what are the kind of things they have to do? Yeah, that's an important yes. part to know. Do you get yeah. to go often and visit the job site and see what these guys do on a regular basis to kind of be familiar with it? No, we don't. But I always try to ask questions like if I have no clue what what their position is. Like mm -hmm. I, someone was like a roughneck and I was like, I don't know what that is. Like, what do you, what does your day look like? What does your typical... <laughs> Yeah. What are your job duties? So that's definitely a part, um, kind of always learning about all these different positions as well. And I don't think we emphasize that, to be honest, in school enough. Mm -hmm. Even for someone who's in acute care, they've just come in and maybe they've first time with AFib and we're giving them a heparin drip or whatever is going on, you know. Um, but we don't actually focus on what do they do and what does this diagnosis mean to them going forward? Like how yeah. is it going to fit into your workplace and your daily life? We don't really yeah. focus on that a lot. Yeah. And I think we could do a better job at that because we're supposed to nurse the whole person, mm -hmm. especially in your environment where these people are coming to you and you're kind of that middle person between off work, on work, and what is it going to look like for me to continue to be productive? Yeah, exactly. Yeah. You definitely don't do a good enough job. I don't, I don't think maybe that's a gap you're noticing too. 
Yeah. And I think too, if you're like me, you probably spend most of your time at work than you do, you know, at home. So you want to make sure you're safe. Other people are safe. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Does, does things like, um, so like this coronavirus outbreak, do you guys talk about that among your team? Is this an issue where you guys consider, because you have a lot of people thinking of Fort McMurray condensed in a small place. Yeah. Is this part of the contingency planning or you do like active screening and education? Right now we just have a, a questionnaire or a kind of a screening form that we get everybody to fill out before they come in, before we do any kind of testing. And so far, it's uh, we haven't had to take any of the precautions so like wearing a mask or anything mm -hmm. like that but yeah we do have a, a screening process for that going on right now mm -hmm. so that's only if they're actively coming to see you yeah if, if, if on like job site you're not involved in any education programs or anything no okay just check in to see how far that scope goes yeah <laughs> Awesome. So what are some of the initiatives that you've been a part of in this role? Because how long have you been doing this now? Um, two and a half years. Wow, that's awesome. Two and a half years. So there's probably been some changes and some things that have gone through process change. Maybe talk about some of the things that you've seen or you've been a part of that have improved patient care. Or has it just been pretty standard, like the same old, every day you come in, nothing's really advanced. Like I thinking the hair sample to me would just kind of blew my mind. I think of advancements there. You'd mentioned the saliva was one of them. Yeah, definitely the saliva. That wasn't very common when I first started. Mm -hmm. um, just new kinds of, so like I said, with the drug testing panels, so different mm -hmm. drugs coming in like fentanyl, um, that kind of stuff, different drugs that we're testing for now that, you know, <laughs> to before. yeah, yeah. Uh, I'm trying to think of any other occupational issues that might be quite new in the news. And the only thing that comes to my mind is the coronavirus. And uh, I just think of that isolated people, like that group of people so close together. Um, so that's why I was wondering if there was anything that you had noticed in terms of initiatives in occupational health that are changing as a result of the world issues or like those kind of things that are happening in the world. Nothing comes to mind, hey? I don't know. Yeah, I know. Oh, that's all good. That's all good. So talk to me about maybe somebody who has influenced you in your workplace, inspired you, and why they inspire you. Because you've mentioned that you work with a lot of different professionals. I know, and you are in a really unique position because you're working a little bit more closely with some professionals that nurses don't get to see every day. Yeah. So I think you have a unique perspective. Um, and I'm wondering how they inspire you in terms of your day to day. Um, for me, I think one person is, again, I don't really work beside them directly every day, but we have. Uh, what we call our medical review officer. So I had the chance to go, we had our company hosted a big conference and um, she talked a lot about um, opioid crisis and, and that kind of stuff. And which um, was just very interesting. And just to kind of see how, like I said, I don't really see like the, the nitty gritty of everything and the mm -hmm. substance use programs and that kind of stuff. So yeah. it's always inspiring to see, to really see the bigger picture of just a little part of, of what I do. Doesn't that give you perspective as to the value of what you do sometimes? Like when you don't know where you fit on the wheel, yeah, you're going to get together with all these other people and you're like, oh, that's where I fit. I get it. Like yeah. it's an important role and kind of maybe gives you a different perspective on what you're doing every day. Yeah, absolutely. Especially when, you know, day after day you're doing drug tests and, and drug test after drug test or a medical exam and you just kind of forget, you know, like, why am I doing this? Why is this, why is this so important? So it's nice to have, um, you know, maybe a company meeting or huddle every once in a while, just kind of, kind of remind you that there is a bigger picture to all this. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah. Do you know how many people you guys serve like do you guys know that, that kind of data on a daily basis like with all the organizations that you're working with 
Um, no, I know it is a lot. We've been taking on quite um, quite a few bigger clients lately. Yeah. Yeah. So it's and we have uh, we have three clinics in Edmonton area: Calgary, Fort Mac, um, a bunch of staff up at at the oil field camps, and then again. In Ontario, we have quite a few clinics and our head office there. I think we, and then we have like all these third party companies as well. So it's quite a big organization. Hmm. And you know, it's funny because I've only ever heard of them because I've spoken with nurses who've graduated and they're working. And I, I, there's one other nurse that I have, I think I've interviewed or I've just chatted with and she had mentioned the same company and I'd never heard of them before. So yeah. How did you find out about them? Um, I think I, was search. I remember when I first graduated, I applied to a, f a few Oc Health um, places actually. I don't know, it was just something very interesting to me. And my dad had always worked, um, you know, in the oil field. So I don't know. It was, it's kind of interesting how both our worlds kind of came together. Yeah, that sure is. Yeah, I think I just happened to apply at the right place at the right time. Did your dad know about this company? Or you just, just you saw the ad? No, he didn't. He's never heard of it either. <laughs> yeah. Well, it sounds like being an Ontario-based company, they're probably out here because of the industry, right? Yeah. Yeah. A lot exactly. Yeah. How long did it take you to get your first job? So I, I worked casual. I think I had just got my temporary license and I got, I started this job like a week after. Oh, a week after that or something. But I, so I was casual for maybe six or seven months. Um, and then I had the opportunity to work full time because we call it shutdown season. Mm -hmm. So when the the big camps shut down, um, people go in for maintenance. It gets it gets super busy for us because all these people have to come in, get their uh, respirators fit for drug tests, and just you just see. Um, lots of testing coming through. So I got to work during that really busy time because we needed the more staff to accommodate that. Mm. Um, and then that's when, after that, I had the chance to go up north. And then after, when I came back from that, I there just happened to be a, a full time mm -hmm. position for me. So yeah, it kind of, it kind of all worked out. That's really cool. How long does it take down typically? We talking days, weeks? Um, I think like weeks, months. Yeah, I think so. I think it is like uh, three weeks or three months is what's in my head. Yeah. I actually no. Yeah. Yeah. I have some relatives that work up north as well and they've talked about the shutdown as well, but I just can't remember how long that is. Yeah. And then usually we see that influx of testing springtime and fall. Okay. Twice so, yeah. <laughs> yeah so that's usually when we get really busy. So coming up here, we're expecting March is to be super busy. So yeah. When you went up north for those three months, did you get paid, like, um, as I understand it, in Alberta, there's kind of like this line when you cross it, you get um, Northern Living Allowance? Yeah. Were you um, receiving that as well then? Um, a living allowance? Yeah, extra pay because you're up north in the remote area. Is that part of it? Um, yeah, I was up in the camp, like, staying in the, in the camp, though. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, I did definitely got an increase in, in okay. wage. Yeah, I think it's important for our listeners to know that um, that there are some advantages when you go up north. Yeah. Just pay. You like the yeah. seven on and seven off. Mm -hmm. What were some of the disadvantages though? Like, I mean, not every job is rainbows and sunshine every day. Yeah, um, just the whole camp life, it's totally different. Like just being by yourself or um, you had a room, like your own room there, you didn't have to share? No, I, I had your own room. Food was really good, though, where I was. Um, nice yeah, it, it's all cooked it, for you, you don't have to do dishes. Yeah, that's a nice <laughs> part, too. Yeah. yeah. And what about, like, just day-to-day? -day? So you want to watch a movie. Can you go off camp and do that, or do you have to stay on camp? Uh, you do. I personally had a company vehicle. Um, but I mostly just stayed there. They have like a gym there, TV, I had a TV in my room, that kind of stuff. So, so you're not without amenities. You do have a job. No. Yeah. No. 
but it, I can imagine it gets um, boring or lonely because some people work like 24 days on or four, four days off, so. 24 on and four days off? Yeah, that's what, a, yeah, a lot of people do that. Wow, four days off is nothing after all that time. Mm, no. Ugh. Hey, I wouldn't want that work. No, <laughs> I wouldn't want that. <laughs> that's crazy. All right, so for those who are listening and are thinking, okay, occupational health sounds kind of cool. Like, I think I could do this work. What would be your recommendation for them? Or your advice for them? Uh, yeah, try it out. Like I said, you don't have to be a nurse to work in Oc Health, which was something I never knew till I got into it. So if it's something um, you're kind of, if you are in nursing school or thinking about nursing school or not, is you can start as a drug and alcohol technician. You can do your extra schooling if you want for those audio and PFT courses. You just kind of get a foot in the door, see if, see if you like it. Some of this actually could lead into uh, a potential self-employment area as well. That these skills would be something you could then be hired on as a contractor to fulfill. Like you mentioned, you were casual at first, but I'm now thinking with the skill set, as you mentioned, you don't have to be a nurse. You can get your pulmonary function testing, your audiometric testing. Uh, you can learn about the drug screening. But this might be a really nice pocket for self-employment. Have you ever thought of that? Um, yeah, I think it would definitely be a lot. Um, mm -hmm. Just kind of getting that customer or client base. But even something just like um, respirator fit testing, you could oh, go yeah. and do on your own. Like I, like I had to get fit for one for nursing school so that's that's, okay. that's something kind of within Oc health that you could do on your own yeah that's yeah. right and I, I know a lot of people who do do that yeah cool so here's um the last question so i actually send these kind of out to facebook world to say hey i'm going to interview somebody in this world what would you like to know about them and one of the questions is what is the most challenging part of your job um, I think, like I mentioned before, is just confronting people um, about their drug results or asking for the the second sample again because again, you never know how they're going to react. And yeah. I've I've been called all sorts of names, yeah. but you just you can't take it personally. And are you ever alone in those situations, or is there always somebody else in the clinic? There should be someone always, always with you because there's been stories from other Oc Health companies where a situation like this escalated to being physical. So that's um, safety is definitely an important thing as well. Yeah, okay. I would think so. Okay, what is your most favorite thing to do when you're not working? Um, just relaxing. <laughs> Uh, well, actually, I don't have a whole lot of time to do that right now. I'm also doing my RN online. Are you at Athabasca University? I am, yes. Yeah. You know, I um, I happen to work there, right? <laughs> oh, you do? I didn't know that. Yeah, you're going to see me at some point because I teach in the patho and the farm class and I take students to clinical. Okay, awesome. Yeah, that's awesome that you're advancing your education. Yeah. Is this driven by um, like watching other RNs in your field or are you looking for maybe some opportunities that just come with the degree? Yeah, definitely more opportunities. Like I said, like this was my first job. Um, I, there's just so many areas in nursing. It's like, how do you know mm -hmm. what's kind of your, your area? Like I just know there's just so many options out there and I just, um, not that I can't do them, as an LPN, I just feel like I may have more options and opportunities as uh, with with some more education. Well, I don't think education is wasted. Like it's always a benefit. No matter what you do, you're going to learn something, and you either incorporate it or you don't. But you still learn something. Yeah, definitely. Has value to you. So I think it's a good idea. Yeah. It's always upgrade. Okay. Um, well, we already kind of talked about those. What was your best advice? This was the top five tips for somebody who wants to be an occupational health nurse, but we, I think we've covered that, hey? The extra education, yeah, some research. Uh, what would be the best way to prepare for an interview in occupational health? That's a good question. Um, yeah, I think we're always wanting to know, what questions do they ask? 
thinking back to mine, it was a fairly standard interview. Um, you know, like, what are your strengths? What are your weaknesses? I don't remember there being any scenario based questions, maybe beside the fact of um, being put into a, a situation like I get put in often yeah. about confronting someone. Yeah. Other than that, I, f I think it was a fairly standard um, interview. Okay. Well, yeah. they, they didn't ask anything specific about disease processes or testing. It was more just how would you deal with the situation, behavioral type questions. Yeah. Yeah. Did you have your PFT and audiometric before this job or that was something you got after? That was something I got after. Okay. And so I'm assuming that they probably subsidized the, um, the course so that you could get the training. Yeah. Perfect. That's another bonus. Yay. Yeah. It was awesome. I love when organizations step up and they actually pay yeah. for the training they want. They're free stuff. education. <laughs> yeah. And how long were those courses? Just out of curiosity, do you remember? Uh, I think you have like your typical university semester to finish it. So it, was, um, it wasn't paced. You just got to sign in and do things as you got them done. Yeah, it's, it's also all online. So you do have to finish it by a certain point. No midterms or anything, just one final test. And no practical? Practical, you have to do, you can do it with someone who's already certified. So like my team lead, I just did it with her and they can sign off and send all, all your information off there. Oh, perfect. Do you know what would have happened if you didn't have, like say out of interest, I take this course tomorrow, I sign up and I actually don't work in a workplace where I have access to that. Did McEwen offer those services where they would pair you up with somebody? Do you recall? Yeah, they also have people there that can do that, sign off your okay. portion for you. Yeah. I think that's also important for those who are thinking, I don't work with somebody, how yeah. do I get it done? But that is yeah. taken care of. Awesome. So, and those were both one semester long courses. Yeah, I did mine at the at the same time though. Okay, so they're yeah. manageable yeah. while working full time. So I think that sounds quite doable for those who are interested in occupational health. Yeah. Awesome. So anything else you'd like to share with those who are listening about your career path currently and maybe anything I didn't ask? Um, that stands out. Just another thing in my day-to-day my -day work, I guess, um, is we also do something called physical abilities testing. Awesome. So, so basically, um, just making sure that they can handle the physical demands of the job and that they can do it safely. So it's basically just a bunch of weightlifting. So again, depending what the company has requested, um, the participant will go through a series of exercises, lifting weights, um, increasing the weight, and you're just there. You're assessing their blood pressure and heart rate after each exercise and just making sure that they're able to handle the physical <laughs> demands. The physical yeah. demands. Yeah. Would they have to do this like with stairs, for example, if there's a lot of stairs in their job or just it's pretty stationary, like it's all on the one level? Yeah, uh, we do incorporate stairs. We have ladders. Um, we have a device that can measure how much they can push and pull, how much their grip strength is, and that kind of stuff. Oh, the grip strength test. Yeah. <laughs> I remember that. <laughs> <laughs> Fascinating. Excellent. Is there anything else that we need to know about becoming an occupational health nurse that we haven't covered? Um, I don't think so. All right. So you said you're, you don't have a lot that you do off hours, but you have a dog that you mentioned at the beginning of this. Yes. Tell me about your dog. Um, so my dog, she is also, is actually a Dalmatian. Oh, really? Yeah, her name is Bean. <laughs> definitely keeps you busy when you're not at work then. Yeah, yeah, definitely. How old is Bean? She is seven. Oh, so you've had her for a while, or him? Uh, she, we adopted her when she was three years old, so. Nice. Yeah. Well, I think that's a lovely way to decompress after the day is to just hang out with the dog. Oh, yes. Go for a walk, get some physical activity, get outside in the sun. That's all great self-care stuff. Yeah. Um, I don't know if you find your job overly stressful or if you come home and you kind of have the weight of your job on you. Some days, definitely, yeah. Yeah. So it sounds like that's a great self-care activity that you already have built into your house. <laughs> yeah. 
Fantastic. Well, thanks so much for sharing what an occupational health nurse kind of day looks like and letting our listeners know how they can position themselves for a job in that career. Thank you. I'd like to thank Sandy for sharing her journey today and letting us know a little bit more about occupational health nursing. Now to get the full audio visual, the after the recording videos and the downloads, head on over to frontlinenursingpodcast.com and become a member today. Now, if you have a story you'd like to share, email me at info at We'd love to have you on the show. Thanks for listening.